My name's Lou Weinstock. I, I had come from uh, uh, Penn State University. I was a graduate in economics there. And we, all the, the people my age, men, were facing the Vietnam War draft. And certainly some of us did not want to go. And one of the ways out was to get deferments through, through graduate school and through uh, the Peace Corps. And, I, and it turned out that I had a friend there at, uh, uh, at Penn State who had just come back from the Peace Corps in, in North Africa, in Tunisia. And he recommended it highly. So I looked into it, and uh, that's what I decided to try to do. And uh, I was originally accepted to go to uh, Brazil, which I didn't particularly want to go to. I, I had thought I would wanted to go to Turkey, <laughs> of all places. And uh, there were no openings in Turkey. And uh, ultimately, since I got accepted in Brazil, they, they said that I could have a choice of going either to, uh, to uh, Brazil or Guatemala if I so choose, chose. And I, after a little research, I decided to choose Guatemala. And that was it. That's the story. Well, we, we were associated with the National uh, Credit Union uh, movement. And, and what we were charged with doing was uh, improving or forming credit unions to allow the campesinos uh, the ability to borrow, to be able to buy fertilizer or whatever, which is a concept they hadn't really known, saving and borrowing. and. Uh, that's what we were charged with doing, but unfortunately, um, at that time and just after, there were much greater forces involved than, than, than we could even think about in those days. The, the whole Guatemalan government was really at war with these people, these poor people, and uh, I think it went for naught in, the, in those days. Uh, I don't know what happened in specific instances, but there have, were many, many bad instances. I worked in three villages. Ultimately, at, at first, I, I they were different, three different villages, but because of a conflict with the priest, I had to move from the first town. And, uh, uh, I moved to a town called, uh, which had a cooperative and two other towns associated with it that had just been formed by another volunteer who was leaving. And so he was anxious for, to have someone replace him so that someone would be there. And this was in uh, Santiago Atitlan. And it, it turned out to be a really beautiful spot. And it was an ideal, ideal place to be. And um, I never saw the priest again, but that, that was a, a bad story in that town. Uh, the priest was one of these dictators who thought I was a communist and uh, really couldn't, couldn't stand anyone else having any influence over the particularly young boys in, the, in that particular town. So. So did, he left, or how did that? I, I left. I, pardon the, the priest. I have no idea what happened to him. He was from from Washington State. Oh, uh, he was American. Yeah, the priests were all Americans. Yeah, and the priests in the town where I lived were from the Archdiocese of Oklahoma. And there were three priests there. And uh, there's a lot of bad stuff happened out of that. The the when I went back to visit in 1973, we, we mostly were with uh, Father Stan, Stan Rother, also from Oklahoma. 
and after we had left and in the early 80s he was uh, they, they they attacked him in the in the where he was sleeping and they killed him with machetes yeah that's the the government people yeah were there any other people that you were close with that you know met untimely ends because I, of your involvement not because of my involvement not your personally but well i more, i think yeah i think I, I think that a lot probably did but they weren't they weren't Americans. They were hurt in any way. It was the uh, the Guatemalans themselves that probably were, because we were were associated with the co-ops, which is the credit union, which those people thought of as vaguely communist communistic, which of course they couldn't stand. And uh, I don't know the details, but I'm sure that some of them were killed. Yeah. In, in some of the towns that I was in, yeah. No, we mostly spoke their language. Every town had a different language, and uh, uh, I used to, you know, we spoke Spanish because, uh, well, I made an attempt to try as, to learn as much as I could of their language. I, I, uh, I was probably one of the guys who learned more of, of the language. The town I lived in, the language was called Tsutuil, and it's only spoken there, and, and in a town called uh, San, uh, no, San Lucas, Toliman, and slightly different but, dialect, but uh, Santa Maria Asuncion, which was next to Santa Clara. Santa Clara, they spoke Quiche, and then right next to it, was it Santa Maria, and they spoke Tsutuil. But again, it's not the same Tsutuil that Santiago speaks. That, but I, anyway, I tried to learn as much as I could, considering at that time there were no books, there was no written anything. I, uh, there is since then, there, has there are books done by the, these Bible translator people that, that Try you know want to have the Bible in every language in the world, and uh, they they since have done some work with the Sutuil. And uh, so I what I did was I asked questions of the people who spoke both and got translations and wrote them down as best as I could so that I could read it back. And. Um, it, it was an interesting thing I, I, that I could speak a little bit, but not a lot. It's, it's not easy. It's very difficult because the whole thought patterns are different in, in that language, in those languages. These are all Mayan languages from the ancient Maya. And uh, I, I, have the book, I, I have some of the books somewhere that, that I actually wrote the things, you know, so it's, it's, you can read them. And see what what was in them, okay. but I, yeah. you know, you you know you you won't know what it sounds like because you really need a native to speak it. Every once in a while, you see a Spanish word like socios and cooperativa, but all the rest of it's in uh, Tutuil. It's not long. What I did do with that language was uh, the priest in the town I lived had his little radio station, and I made and wrote little ads for the radio station uh, in the language, which was Tutuil, to join the benefits of joining the co-op. <laughs> so that was interesting, but I, I wished I had a, a copies of them, but, and you know, the, they, they had guys, natives on the staff, and they, they read them, but, uh, 
it was an interesting experiment. I, I don't know how much good it did or not, but it was something. They had their own radio station. So all the broadcasting in that station from that from the priest, it was all in Sutuil. It was totally in that language. You know. There were, uh, in the town of, uh, one of the towns I worked in was above uh, Santiago. It was about, oh, 2,000 feet up. And I had to hike there. We took a, bo a boat first and then and these dugout canoes and then uh, had to hike up. And that's Santa Clara, La Laguna. They were, there were a few people in that town who were really hard workers. And one of the things that, uh, that they did was they, they made uh, baskets for the coffee crops down in the lower altitudes. And they asked me if, I could, if they would help me, help them uh, to find markets for it. So I borrowed a Peace Corps Jeep and uh, they, you know, obviously I had to ask them and they, they thought it was a good project. And then uh, we went on a, a trip down from Santa Clara, down, down, down to the uh, coffee plantations, which were at a much lower altitude. We went back, back roads and back ways and, and uh, uh, they they brought their baskets and they sought out at each plantation the they they called them maestros but the guy who was the head of the of the uh, of the plantation they they were intimidated somewhat because these guys were big strong and the Indians are short shy. It, it was difficult. They had a difficult time. They sold a few, not too many, and and uh, <coughs> we uh, we went to different places and we down down there into a different few different towns and then spread out to the to the uh, plantations. And we, at night we slept at the, on the on the steps of the of the uh, mayor's houses. <laughs> <laughs> we 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 had blankets and and uh, I stayed with them. I didn't, you know, I could have gone to a little hotel or pension or something, but uh, I stayed with them on the on the steps. And uh, that, you know, it was it was very interesting. And it, I don't know. I think it would have been dangerous in later years, but uh, at that time it didn't seem to be dangerous to me. And. Uh, they, that helped them a little bit to sell those things, and we, we, uh, he, they took a few orders, and we, uh, we got to know a little bit about the coffee production in Guatemala that way, which I didn't know anything about. And they used these baskets to collect the coffee beans and to, to lay the, out the beans to dry. You know. Well, the most that we did together was uh, with uh, Bill Brock and Dave Milholland because the three of us uh, made a collection of the Wipilis of, of Guatemala, and we would go on on trips together to different villages trying to collect this Wipil or that Wipil. And uh, we each collected in the range of, uh, I don't know, 60, 70 Wipilis from different villages, and the, each of those involved going you know, going to different villages, many off the beaten track, you know, where we'd have to hike in and and see if we could find one without re re creating too much of a fear. I mean, we, we uh, they were not used to selling the clothes off their back, which basically happened some of the times, but we offered some money. It was, they weren't really expensive because they're, they weren't used to selling them. and. Uh, but I, I suppose they were they were valuable to them in terms of money, and th would obviously uh, they could keep making them. They could make another one if they didn't have a, a spare, 
because they, they produced the uh, wipilas themselves. They were not, not store-bought. They were, everything was handmade. So um, it was interesting, and, and uh, Dave and, and, and Bill, Bill Brock, uh, and I had some, quite a few adventures doing that in different towns. And we got to see a good part of Guatemala. There's only a few little Indian villages that we didn't actually get to. We didn't, we didn't go to the ones that didn't have wipilas, which was not many. Most of them did. Most of them did have wipilas. So we bought the wipilas and sometimes other pieces of clothing as well, if if they were nice. Yeah. And sometimes I would go with Dave alone, and sometimes with Bill, and we would, we you know we. We not only were after the Wipilas, it was also after the adventure of seeing different towns and interacting with the people of those villages. Yeah, cool. so, yeah no, it was fun. It, would, it gave us an excuse to travel to all these towns. And uh, we found out a lot about Wipilas. We became experts in it, actually, all three of us. Yeah. And it eventually was how I got to the United States because uh, the Catholic priest in the town I lived in knew a guy who was an anthropologist at University of Pennsylvania, and, and the guy who was became the chairman of the department in at University of Pennsylvania uh, asked me if if I would mind lending them to him if the whole collection if I brought if he brought them back which he did. He, he had them all air freighted back to the United States at the University of Pennsylvania. And that, that all worked smoothly. I didn't pay anything to get them back. So, and that's how I met my wife, Rosa, and, and uh, the rest is history, as they say. What was the story with the big trek where you guys like were on those horses and stuff with that picture? Yeah, that that was just a. Uh, it's just a day trip, right? No, oh. it was several days. <laughs> no, it was too far for a day trip. That was that was a long, long trek. Uh, it was we started in Agua Catan and went to which was Dave Milholland's place, and then we went up to a town called Nebach, and then a town called Cotzal, and then uh, uh, Chahul, which. These towns, all, particularly Chahul, uh, have suffered greatly during the time of repression in the 80s. And uh, they were devastated, actually. And uh, then from there, actually, we, we went from Chahul, we went through some aldeas, really, to, to the north. And uh, to the town of Barillas. And uh, from there, there was a, that was the end of the road. And uh, from there, we took a bus back. You know, it was like five days. It was a long, it was long, long and hot. Yeah. That was, uh, the, there were, a few of us were there. It was not everybody, obviously. There was Dave Milholland, uh, Bill Brock, uh, Don Livingston. And who else was there? Peter Keeler, who was not one of our group, but was an, uh, a linguist who was traveling with us. One day, uh, there appeared on, on the scene in the town I was living in, which is Santiago Atitlan, uh, a tall Frenchman named Michael Mendelssohn. And it turns out that he had studied in previously in, in Santiago, and he was known in Santiago. He, he ultimately had changed his name to Nathaniel Tarn and became, a, instead of an anthropologist, he became a poet. <laughs> anyway, he came back and people actually remembered him from when he was an anthropologist there and he was very touched and all. And uh, it, I, I don't remember what day it was, but it was a day that some of the cofradías were celebrating uh, a certain festival. The cofradías are take off of, of things that religious things in Catholicism. Uh, 
that the Indians adapted, but they they prayed to what the Catholics would call idols as opposed to Jesus and all those things. Uh, so anyway, they were they were doing they were having a cofradia celebration in one of the houses in town, and he wanted to go, and uh, so we went. And one of the things that they do in these cofradias is that they have a real strong alcohol made out of cane, and uh, he drank a lot of it. It's really strong, and I didn't want to drink any of it, although I had to drink a little because they, when you go into their houses, they expect you to, to partake or whatever. And I drank a little bit, but could barely, you know, I could barely tolerate it. And he drank a lot and got very, very drunk. And uh, I had to help him home. And he's a big guy and he was, he put his arms around my shoulder and I had to sort of lug him back away from the from uh, the Cofradia celebration to where he was staying. Um, he returned to the scene and he was very emotional and chumped up and everything that he was there when, he, when I saw him. And then again, he changed his name to Nathaniel Tarn and he became a relatively famous poet. And he actually translated the Pablo Neruda poem uh, Los, Altara, Las Alturas de, de uh, Machu Picchu, and uh, Desde Las Alturas de Machu Picchu. Um, and that was the last I heard of him, <laughs> although I do know that he had published several books of poetry in English. So he, he was in Spanish, and then he was really French. He originally wrote in French. Can you talk about Don Jaime? Um, and like how he became part of your group and what, what, who he was for your group. Well, he was in our group and he was a member of our group. And uh, uh, he was 70 years old when he joined. And of course, that's a little odd. There's not many 70 year olds join. And he, he worked in, in uh, Guatemala City. Um, but he befriended a lot of the guys in our group. and and uh, he became, you know, like a, well, like a father to us. He, he, he never had children himself. And he worked as sort of, a, I guess, as a clerk, mostly, throughout his life. And uh, he had retired, and uh, he decided to join the Peace Corps, and they took him in, which in most cases they wouldn't. I guess he convinced them. and. Uh, but he's he was uh he was very close to a lot of us and uh he was a great guy to have around and to be inspired by he was forever young as they say the group we we were we're not all the same person we we had different views and different look on life and everything else but uh we had this one adventure in common, and uh, it, it's meant a lot to me to, to see everybody and uh, get together. And the fact that we've kept together makes it even more so. I, it's not just all of a sudden coming 30 years later and then just getting together. We've been getting together a lot <laughs> over the years. and. Uh, I, I feel it's really important to me and uh, maybe to, to the other people too because they've been coming to these reunions and uh, no, I, I think it's very important. I, I tend to think that probably of all the Peace Corps groups that there have ever been, this, ours is to be one of the most uh, cohesive in that sense that we've stuck together for all these years and it is a lot of years now. Well, I, I know that other groups have had reunions, but I don't know if they've had as many as us. <laughs> and, and, and of course, it's due mostly to one person, Douglas Noble, who has kept us together, basically. He's done a lot of, a lot of work. He likes to do this, and uh, 
he's a great traveler. He's traveled everywhere in the world. And uh, it's always an adventure for him to get together. And he knows everybody and everybody's wives and, and uh, or husbands, as the case may be. But um, yeah, he's kept us together. And I don't think another group would have done like us unless they also had a, a person like him who did so much of the legwork. You know, at first it wasn't so often, but, uh, and we've gone all over the country and we've gone to Minneapolis and, and uh, California a few times and Austin, Texas. And we've gone, we've gone to many places where people are. And uh, no, it's, it's uh, I think it's a great thing for us anyway. I don't know if it helps anybody else, but <laughs> it's good for us. When did you start listening to Dean Martin? Oh, you know. Well, of course, he's in movies. Oh, yeah. When did you start watching Dean Martin? Well, I think you found out that he was actually a pretty good singer. Mm -hmm. Let me see if that's like. And I have some of his old albums downstairs. I bet you do. You got a lot of stuff down there. Mm -hmm. All right, let's listen to that. Want to say something? What do you want me to say? <laughs> Sing something for me. No. <laughs> Come on. Okay. Everybody loves somebody sometime. That's Dean Martin. <laughs>